Thanks, Chairman, and uh, thanks to our members from the department here today. Uh, could I go back to uh, the issue of airport testing? And um, I've been out in the media last week uh, and earlier this week requesting that we do PCR COVID testing, which I believe is eminently feasible at Dublin and the other airports. And I would, I've made the point already, if we don't do it at the airports, we'll end up doing it in community here a little bit later in the year. So I, I note the comments that were made by the previous speaker where he said that uh, I think the medical advice was that the testing regime wasn't robust enough or didn't capture enough and therefore uh, essentially wasn't almost worth doing. So I'd point out that PCR COVID testing, which is what we do in the hospitals presently, is about 80 to 85 per cent effective. And I'm not sure that there's any test anywhere that's more effective than that. So essentially, we decide when we test uh, that we are going to miss people who are asymptomatic at the time or very early on in the infection. They don't show up. And essentially, a subsequent test, if they have symptoms, is how we establish the fact that they're COVID positive. And then we go through all the rigmarole of, of contact tracing and all the rest of it. But uh, I, I heard what you said about testing in outside airports or in foreign centres. And I'm wondering, has anybody looked at the costs of doing that, what we're proposing to do abroad, that we could probably do now quite easily here, and we certainly know the costs of doing it here. I'm not sure that we know what we're going to pay for doing it abroad. We will still have the same amount of, of slip-through, regardless where we do it. So maybe if somebody wants to take that for a moment, please. Maybe if I could just um, give some remarks and, and uh, ask Vinton to address um, if there's anything else that he wants to add. Uh, I guess the benefit of departure testing, Deputy, is that, um, first of all, the person uh, would be required to uh, take the test herself or himself uh, within 24 to 72 hours before actually departing, uh, and that result would be presented uh, to the INIS uh, on arrival at Dublin Airport, uh, and obviously the, the person wouldn't travel if a negative test, um, or sorry, if, if a positive test was returned. Um, the benefit of that would be that the person would not have actually travelled, would not have uh, potentially come into close contact with all of the fellow travellers, uh, and therefore uh, we would be avoiding a situation where if you had entry testing and somebody became positive or was tested positive, that we would have to do all of the, uh, the follow-up that would be required with the fellow travellers. So, th so there is that benefit. Uh, there is also the benefit of uh, the cost um, uh, being uh, borne by uh, the traveller. Um, uh, and there is also the issue with regard to capacity. So the capacity for testing on arrival uh, doesn't arise if you have departure testing. So that, that's why we're looking at that uh, as closely as we are. Uh, and there is the potential not only to do um, a high street test where a person would purchase their own test and do it, but we could uh, up the standardisation of that through colleagues in the Department of Health, National Public Health Emergency Team uh, and the Health Protection Surveillance Centre uh, so that we would set the bar uh, relatively high and apply that uh, to departure points. Uh, and again, that would um, address issues with regard to capacity, uh, 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 credibility, obviously, uh, and cost. Um, so that's why we're looking at that uh, as, as hard as we are. Well, can I um, say, uh, sorry to cut across in this dispatch, but my time will be limited here. So I accept the logic of what you're proposing, okay, but the next question is then, if, if this is the route we're going, a, are those tests available at the points of departure uh, or prior to people departing, and B, when do you see something like this being put in place? Yeah, uh, still being considered, Deputy. Um, yes, they are. As I said, um, it is possible to, to purchase um, reputable uh, COVID-19 tests. And, and to take them yourself um, in most uh, uh, countries around the world. So, so yes, they are available. Uh, and were we to move to the um, the Irish applied standard, uh, that that is something that is being considered uh, in consultation with colleagues at the department. I, I think one thing that will take some time. There's, there's obviously potential there for people to. Uh, uh, I suppose defraud that test in a way if you're presenting your your. Um, 
your laminar test flow or whatever it is you bring in your show and you say, here's the result I got. It would be like bringing a pregnancy test kit with you to show somebody the stripes on it because that's effectively what you're addressing in those uh, diagnostic test kits that you're talking about. That's essentially how they work. Unless you have another one, and you may have that I don't know about, I'm not an expert. I know a little bit about it. But anyway, having said that, I think the most important thing is that the department needs to flag if that's what's being proposed, that it get proposed and it gets done because we need to do something with uh, certainly the foreign travel, particularly from the US and, and South America in particular and, and other countries that are not on the green list. But going beyond that then, and we've heard from the aviation sector here this morning and we've uh, more or less, I think it has been established that uh, getting on a flight and assuming that people don't have COVID, but for those that are asymptomatic, uh, the transmission rate would appear to be very low because of the negative air pressure in the cabin, uh, because of the recirculation and the HEPA filters and all of that. So we can assume that we're saying it's safe then for people to get six hours and be beside one another uh, wearing masks. And the question then is, why are we not doing that for the taxi sector? Why are we not mandating masks? And I, and I heard the previous contributor saying that a taxi man can ask people to uh, put on a mask. I would remind you that a, a bus driver was kicked to death in France a couple of weeks ago by two people full of alcohol because he asked them to wear a mask getting on a bus. And I don't think it's, it's uh, um, operationally possible for a lot of people, particularly for those who are earning very little money, if they go back out taxing to start asking customers to wear a mask because the first thing the customer will say, I don't have it. Secondly, the taxi man will have to supply it as his expense and even then they may not wear it. So I think it would be far better if the department took a leadership role here and I know you'll go back and say that the medical advisors and effort and everybody else doesn't, hasn't come to you and said it's a good idea. I think we need to look at what's going on in other countries and, and you're a lead agency here and I think you're quite in a position to come out and say it's, it's the position of the people gathered here around this table this evening, the leadership of your department to say we're making a strong recommendation that masks should be mandated for taxes. Is that a reasonable? Is that a reasonable position? Yeah. To, just before we go on to the masks for taxis, I, I guess it is important to note that we are um, learning as we go. That we are at the start of the, of a lot of the measures, particularly when it comes to international travel. Um, I, I suppose the the um, engage, explain, encourage approach that we have taken up to now has worked quite well across the board. Um, it, you know, if somebody were to take a test at departure point and be positive and decide, um, you know, to hell with this, I'm going to travel anyway, and to decide themselves to put people in danger, that would be, you know, pr pretty serious decision for that person to take. Uh, it would be contrary to what we've seen in terms of, um, you know, almost universal compliance uh, with requests uh, to, to be in this together, and we would expect that, that, uh, that we would continue to see uh, good compliance uh, along the lines as we have seen uh, up to now. Um, Deirdre, do you want to address the issue with regard to face coverings for taxis, yes, please? Yeah. Um, you're right, Deputy. Face coverings are important, and we are moving to introduce mandatory face coverings in taxis. Uh, the first priority was to arrange it for mass transit, which is the, the buses and the trains and the trams, where you have large numbers of people moving together. Um, and that has been introduced. Uh, we understand the compliance levels are very high. The NTA um, have been in constant touch with the operators of the services and we're hearing of rates typically in the mid 90 per cent um, and in some cases 100 per cent. Particularly strong compliance um, when the vehicles are more full at the, at the peak hours um, on don't, I don't mean to be rude. Transit. I'm very limited on time here, so just. Yeah, sorry, Deputy, I, I'm, move on. Yeah. I'm glad to hear. So what I would say to you is please, urgency. urgency, urgency here. I, I know you're looking at yeah. it and you're considering it and you're analysing it. What people want to see out there, and I think for public confidence, you need to demonstrate urgency that, you know, to say to us here in committee today that you're looking at it and you wanted to get it done in the public transit, there's no reason why it cannot be done across the board. Ask government if they have to, to put some 
some emergency legislation in place to, to mandate it. That's what needs to be done uh, with respect. I ask you also, uh, it came up here this morning with taxi drivers about screens uh, that the NTA essentially don't have any preferred screen to, to give uh, protection between the drivers and, and their occupants. And yet at the same time, if somebody puts in a screen, they're essentially breaking the law. They probably have an insurance issue. Can we not find some common ground here to basically make recommendations that, that it, this is not rocket science. I'm responsible for two incentives, for two initiatives that were taken up by NEFIT. I'm not an expert, but if I go and look at these things and I talk to the people concerned, logic would tell you what we need to do, and they can be done. And I'm, I'm frustrated asking you the questions here today, why these things can't be done and listening to what we're listening to. And I accept that the department has uh, you know, a remit here that they have to look at it in the round. But the, this is not rocket science. These are simple measures, and they, they would give confidence to the public, and they would give confidence to employers, and generally show the country that we are trying to go in a way to mitigate this disease, and not make simple, simple solutions so difficult to implement. Uh, you, uh, you can come back to me, please, in writing about the screens for the taxis. Can I read something into the record here, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a person who has a limo business doing weddings, okay? This uh, gentleman, uh, the structure for limo driving for, for weddings that this gentleman has, he has vehicles that must be NCT'd every six months, and the cars are then booked in for a suitability booking, inverted in commas, which is an inspection to grant the licence. They pay this every six months for the service and licence. This gentleman paid over the phone for a suitability test, and then it got cancelled due to the lockdown. He was refunded for the booking, but he had paid out for the NCTs on his cars in the lockdown, which have been idle for the last number of months. He has now tried to book again, and he is being informed that he has seven days in which to complete the booking. And if not, he has to have the NCTs done again. He has received no re reimbursement for the NCTs and is now expected to carry out 13 NCTs in the next seven days or face a €500 Euro fine per car. Can we please address this type of nonsense? Uh, and this lack of joined up thinking. We have people out there who are at their wits end in business and we have this government regulation in different departments who do not talk to each other and small business people are being hammered time and time again. They cannot get into business and when they're up in business all they have is one regulation to meet after another. Now I implore you please, the same with driving tests. I have a young lady who's graduated college, she has a fantastic job, one of only three in the country, and she needs a full driving licence in order to get this job, and she cannot get a test, and by September she's been told by this multinational if she doesn't have a driving, full driving licence they cannot offer her the job because it's a contract of employment. And I'm running around trying to see how can we get her a driving test, and we're told there's no safe way for a driving test to be completed. Now, I would say dual driving cars could have a screen placed in them and we could certainly get emergency driving tests done. Is that an unfeasible ask again, I ask of you? Um, Deputy, thanks for bringing those uh, um, issues to our attention. Um, I, I think it is really important to remember that um, COVID-19 is throwing up an awful lot of challenges uh, to the private sector, to the public sector, to the civil service, to state companies um, and to state agencies. Um, I, I, I would, and it is really important to remember, we are doing really, really well when it comes to the suppression of this virus. Uh, if you look at the stats, uh, we are uh, in the leading pack when it comes to suppressing the virus. Uh, and that is down to how the Irish public have responded uh, under the leadership uh, of uh, departments, uh, including our own department. It's not the case that we have solved every problem, and there are still plenty of problems to be solved, including the, the problems that you've mentioned there. But we will redouble our efforts and do everything that we can do in order to try and identify those issues uh, and solve them where we possibly can. So you've brought some issues to our attention there. Uh, we will look at those and we'll see what we can do to try and, to try and resolve them as quickly as we possibly can. Well, Mr. Spratt, can I say I don't wish to argue the epidemiological uh, outcome of COVID and how we're doing with it, but I do think what would be of benefit, and this committee is not the place to do it, but there are TDs and other uh, representatives around Leinster House who will be very happy to meet with the department, and we'll be very happy to bring these issues, and some of them are quite small. A quick decision could get them answered, okay? And I think that's what uh, all of us want to hear. We want to see movement. I accept it's difficult, and as you say, there's new learnings, but we're all on a learning curve here, and it would be better if we learned it together, and we can do that by having engagement, and I'd seek engagement with yourself and any other deputies on the committee that want to come with me uh, to we try to get these issues spoken about and see can we come up with some resolutions for people, please. H happy to do that, Deputy.
Vi känner inte.